Welcome to the city. <laughs> ah, no, no, no. Yes, I'm going to carry on. Welcome to the Sitting Comfortably podcast. I've lost track of how many we've done, but I do know that we have finished chapter one of The Draftsman, my first novel. This is Laurel Lindstrom speaking, welcoming you to chapter two. Ah, hmm. Are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Chapter two. Simon and Sheila. Sitting at the wheel of the Ferrari, Simon took a deep breath and wondered where to put the key. Staring at it and then at the dashboard, he put the key down beside him on the passenger seat and took tight hold of the steering wheel, clasping it and raising his fingers one by one to study his fingernails. Filthy, once again, his grip started to ease. Slowly he felt his hands soften to caress a thing of beauty, somehow urgent and provocative. He knew it was yearning for him. All he had to do was to put the key in the ignition. He picked it up, reached out, tentative and slow, hesitating and struggling a moment. Come on, come on! His fingers shaking before thrusting the key into its slot. Firm and determined he turned it, and with a couple of clicks, felt the pulse of another being surge across his body. The sound and touch of it rose and swarmed, a caress so terrifyingly dangerous that, breathing fast, he had to switch the engine off again. As he watched, open-mouthed, his hovering fingers suspended and still reaching out to the key, he wondered if he could pull this off. Can he really start this Ferrari for real? Steer it and drive it to the village to buy milk and tea and a dozen chrome bins. Bins! Will the shop have that many? Will they fit in the back of the car? Enough distractions and suddenly reckless and teddy boy bold, he turned the key once more. A surge of long-lost aggression and his foot stamped the pedal right down to the floor, answering the engine's snarling roar with his own primal, deep-throated, screaming rage rising unbidden. Head shaking, his mouth so wide, tongue on chin, the face a contortion that buried his tearing eyes. The revs surged into the red before his foot eased off, and the beast, reluctant and compliant, grumbled down to a steady, pulsing rhythm. Shocked, his breath deep and heavy, Simon's mouth collapsed into an idiotic smile, wide and leering, his hands stroking the steering wheel, up and down, up and down. Relieved, and afraid his moment would pass, Simon squared his shoulders, heard the engine's rumbling tease, sly and imploring for more, and put the car in gear, with barely a touch on the gear stick's silver smooth head. Sweating and slightly dizzy, Exhilarated as the Ferrari roared, eager and impatient to move, Simon was breathing rapid, shallow breaths. The accelerator pedal, barely grazed with the toe of his muddy boot, brought him an unexpected head rush and slight dizziness. He lurched forwards in a series of small leaps before his chafing toe could balance the slide consistently between the accelerator and the clutch. He let intoxication reach up from his feet, through his legs and hips, and back and down his arms to his clutching hands, completing the tingling adrenaline circle that was taking them forwards. He steered into a too tight curve before straightening and surging off down the drive. Somewhere in his head he was still Simon, but everywhere else in his body he was in love, his senses and emotions barely under control leaning into the acceleration pushing into the small of his back he glanced warily in the mirror at the disappearing view and shifted from first to second gear with a fingertip and a flick of the wrist simon was not used to feeling youthful or foolish but he didn't care now about the muddy boots or the fingerprinted paintwork his love was leading him wanton and loose down the lane at fifty miles an hour still in second gear a glance at the speedometer and the hedges passing by far too quickly, he realised that the terror was more than he could take, despite love's charms. His guilty moment had been fleeting, an echo of someone long since gone, even though there had been no such person in his life, not even the idea of one. He'll be wanting a kettle, too, he mused, 
as he reverted to his usual meandering driving style. Not normally stuck in second gear, Simon's driving style was suited to his inclination to flatten any wayward pheasant or pigeon or even mouse, foolish enough to amble onto the road, so he rarely kept a steady line. But this habitual entertainment could be problematic for this particular journey, so he kept straight and hoped nothing would stray into his path. The mess would probably be a lot and hard to hide. It might even make a dent. Approaching his cottage some half-mile up the lane, Simon, cavalier, with an arm draped roguish and wanton across the back, passen back of the passenger seat, pulled up with a sharp little screech and hit the horn. His wife, peering down from an upstairs window, hurried down, while Simon coaxed the engine into a series of excited little revs, a promise to keep his secret safe. As he waited, he watched with satisfaction an approaching horse rider pull up and take an alternative route through the woods instead. At least it might have been an alternative route, rather than the remnants of Simon's swaggering vanity. "'What's this? Who's let you loose on this monster?' Sheila gawped and stared, fish-eyed and slightly horrified. "'Your new boss. Get your coat,' Simon replied. "'He's wanting stuff from the village, and it's getting late, so get a move on.' Folded up, staple-style, in the deep bucket seat, and strapped in tight, Sheila asked, "'So what's he like? When am I expected?' She was mildly interested and intrigued to meet her new boss, but she didn't really care. The boundaries of her life had been fixed long ago, and she knew what she wanted and that for the most of it she had had her way. Now she had reached an age of contentment, satisfied in her world and confident that nothing much was worth getting worked up about. For Sheila, life's uncertainties were no longer anything to be feared, no longer threatening. Martin and Shadowhurst was just work, just another bloke in the big house wanting her to keep it clean, the latest in a short chain that had been growing link by link since the old house was pulled down and the new one put up. The Mannerings had been there first, with all those rowdy children and the mad parents who let the kids run loose all summer long and in all the holidays before sending them back to school. Sheila remembered the time when she noticed flames coming from the garden shed as she was hanging the washing on the line. Mrs Mannering, she shouted, the shed's on fire! Mr. Mannering came rushing out from his glass studio and called to his boys, "'Oi, what's going on?' Just in time to see a small explosion and three of his five sons come running onto the lawn, one of them clutching his hand and screaming, "'Quick! Dad! Michael's blown his hands up!' Much commotion and shouting to someone to call an ambulance and the dogs barking and Michael still screaming as he emerged singed and sooty from the smoke, blood pouring in sudden crimson splashes on his, the bright green lawn. Sheila had reached him first, wrapping his hands, fingers adrift, tight together in a newly laundered pillowcase, blood blooming sudden, fast and greedy across its whiteness. She held his hands and fingers more firmly, watching the flow slow as the blood seeped into big red droplets, searching their way out into the light to shine fresh and bright in the sunshine. And brave Michael, tipping at the edge of childhood, doing his best not to cry any more, hiccuping and gasping, anxious and staring in horror at the pillar slip in terror of what, what it held and fearful of what his dad would say about the trashed shed. Tears continued to fall, but a wicked look stayed in his eyes as he looked back at the demolished mess, a rising thrill of power and excitement mingled with pain's adrenaline. Sheila remembered the washing, and how she watched the smoke breathing its grubby breath on her clean sheets as she held tight the boy's hands. The linens were already picking up specks of black and grey, shining silhouettes on the sullied white fluttering in the smoke-smudged air. She remembered the other boys, all breathless and excited, wide-eyed and shocked and impressed, piling into the car with their mum and dad to follow Michael in the ambulance. She remembered later how Mrs. Mannering had still been in shock, and, sipping incessantly at a paint-stained jam jar brimming with warm white wine, could only repeat how boy boys shouldn't try to make their own fireworks, because that, that's a man's job. They just shouldn't sip-sip. They just should leave that to the men, sip-sip. Sip-sip all the way to bedtime. When Sheila told Simon about it over their tea, he said, 
One of them boys had it coming, just a question of which one and when, nodding and smug, because neither of his children would have ever done anything so dangerously stupid or shown such reckless imagination. When Michael came back from hospital for the last time, some weeks later, he had a reconstructed thumb and forefinger on one hand, and a missing ring and little fingers on the other hand. He bounced up to Sheila and said in a squeak and a growl, "'Could you teach me to knit?' before waggling his bandaged hands in her face. Sheila didn't get the joke and carried on ironing as Michael tiggered his way out into the garden. When the Mannerings moved down to Cornwall to found an artist's collective, she had been glad to see the back of them and their raucous energy. Good riddance, she said. Art wasn't Sheila's thing. At least not the art you couldn't recognise. Her ideas were simple. No nonsense. Black's black, white's white. And there are no greys. At a vague sixty-ish, Sheila, like her husband, with his receding quiff and bumptious attitude, looked pretty much the same as she had when he met her, all those decades gone, only slightly bigger and wrinklier and greyer. She was still anonymous, secure, in a world where nothing had changed much. The sixties, psychedelia and colours in general, had passed her by. The seventies had just been silly, although she did still like to hear some of the music when it came up on the radio of a Saturday. Her clothes were still sensible, plain and slightly dingy, even when they were new, and always too big, because she liked to be comfy. Her air of resolute, disinterested oldness had always been there, even when she was young. To a handsome young man, wary of giggly girls and their mysterious expectations, Simon had not seen a dowdy young woman, too soon time-textured and greyed. He'd seen someone mature exotic and irresistibly sophisticated. For Simon, it had started long before they ever stepped out together. He had loved Sheila ever since th that summer evening in the village hall at the end of the war, when there had been that disappearance. Everyone was called, and Sheila's mum had been helping with the tea and cakes, and then the clearing up. Sheila was nine years old, and Simon was twelve. We're here to find out if anyone has any information that could help us, the police had said. She and Simon, bored and unable to grasp even slightly what was going on, had hidden together under a trestle table. Peering out from behind the tablecloths, they were untying men's shoelaces and trying to smear the ladies' fake seams without them noticing. In their stealthy mischief, they never spoke looking out at the sea of shoes and legs, and just knowing what should happen next and doing it. After all, the laces within reach were undone, and the pencil seemed smudged without anyone noticing, they had wandered out into the soft summer air. They sat eating crumbly dried egg cake on the steps of the village hall, hearing the blurred sounds of anxious discussions, and oblivious to everything beyond their cake, the steps beneath them, the fading sun's gentle embrace, and each other. They married when they were still in their teens, when he first started sporting the Elvis quiff, and the buttons of his shirt were always undone, just that little bit too far. Quite why this preening man had fallen for her, Sheila never really knew, still didn't, even though she remembered that night at the village hall, and how suddenly it had all ended when the people came flooding out and they had to move off with their parents into the chill of dusk to go home. Today he still had the same look, except that the wavy but now sparse quiff was grey and thin, the shoulders not so sharp, and those open buttons teased for a swollen grey wisped belly. She had never really left that moment all their years, those years ago, their beginning. The two of them had rubbed along for many years, content, patient, and arguing no more or less than the next, surviving their ups and downs because the alternative didn't bear thinking about. There was no alternative for them. Any random excitements that came their way were never so exciting as that night in 1945. So they were swiftly subsumed into the fabric of a shared and largely contentless, contentless life. Sheila and Simon had always lived within a five-mile radius of where they and their two children, long since flown, were born. Simon and Sheila were together at peace with their lot, inclined to laziness, addicted to television, the gentle rhythm of the rural year, and each other's quiet and unchallenging company. They were untouchable.
that's the end of the first part of chapter two. Um, thank you very much for listening. It will be posted on YouTube at, at some point. So, thanks again and have a lovely, lovely day. Bye.